We need on-site renewable energy, high efficiency, and all-electric homes everywhere in order to have a safe, just transition. There are going to be incredible opportunities for workers in this new energy economy. That environmental justice is also about communities being able to take charge of their own infrastructure. In 2021, U.S. total primary energy consumption was about 98 quadrillion BTUs, which was equal to about 16% of total world primary consumption. This despite the U.S. percentage of world population being only 4%. In the U.S., we use a lot of energy. More than one quarter of that energy use, 28% to be exact, occurs in commercial and residential buildings. If we look just at our electricity use, 75% of all electricity consumption occurs in buildings. With the goal to fully electrify our building energy use, more buildings will be moving their heating, cooking, and operation systems from natural gas, propane, diesel, and fuel oil to grid electricity. Pair this with home and business electric vehicle charging, and the obvious result is that the amount of electricity use in buildings is set to dramatically increase. Historically, using electricity for heating and other building applications has come with increased prices compared to natural gas. Predicting future financial performance is a difficult exercise that involves comparing the gradually increasing electricity prices versus the volatile price of natural gas in a rapidly changing market. The safest bet is always to hedge against future price increases with energy efficiency. Efficiency is also critical to control electricity prices by reducing the need for new infrastructure that will be paid back through increased electricity rates. If we reduce building energy use by 20% in both the commercial and industrial sectors today, we could save more than $80 billion annually on utility bills. Interestingly, the savings are roughly equivalent to the investment opportunity presented to upgrade the same buildings. And according to the U.S. Department of Energy Building Technologies Office, the on-site deployment of solar, battery storage, and energy management technologies to flex electricity demand to better meet supply will lead to an additional $100 and $200 billion in annual cost savings. This is a significant savings when considering that the National Renewable Energy Lab Electrification Future Study estimates that the full electrification of buildings would increase U.S. electricity system costs by at least $400 billion. Friendly reminder, we will all pay for that $450 billion investment on future electric utility bills. In short, if we want to keep energy bills down and temper electricity price increases, building energy efficiency and demand flexibility is a critical first step to electrification. In this context, the Inflation Reduction Act has laid out significant incentives for building electrification, energy efficiency, and demand flexibility over the next decade. This includes $9 billion in consumer home energy rebate programs focused on low to moderate income households, tax credits for solar, air source heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, electric service upgrades, and electric vehicles, more than $14 billion in a series of grant programs to states to advance electrification and carbon neutral energy generation, $200 million of additional funding for states to train contractors involved in home energy efficiency and electrification, $1 billion in funding for the USDA REAP program, which provides a 50% cost share for rural clean energy projects, $9.6 billion for rural electric co-ops to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels, and $40 billion in additional commitment authority from the U.S. Department of Energy Loan Program Office. Looking at my home using the very convenient calculator provided by Rewiring America, thank you over there, I qualify for $16,250 in tax credits for energy storage, a heat pump, a heat pump water heater, electric panel and wiring upgrades, an electric vehicle, solar, and home weatherization. With all of the stimulus on the table, our biggest challenge is implementation. To dig into the opportunities and the challenges, we talked with Elizabeth Turner, a young architect working in the Twin Cities who founded and manages an architectural design firm focused on energy efficient building design and electrification. Hear more from Elizabeth and other energy efficiency experts at the 2023 Energy Fair from June 23rd through the 25th. 
from Rise Up Live events and general education workshops to the first ever Energy Fair 5K, there's something for everyone. Find your fun at theenergyfair.org. We are joined today by Elizabeth Turner. She is an architect and certified passive house consultant. She's been working uh, to achieve sustainable community development. It depends less energy, saves emissions and costs. She founded Business Precipitate in 2017 to explore emerging methods to integrate design. She teaches a capstone class for sustainability studies at University of Minnesota and was the 2020 recipient of Energy News Network's 40 Under 40. Record recognizing her leadership in the space. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? Great. So good to be with you here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's exciting. We're very interested in digging in on some of your work. So maybe we can just get started and you can tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you're focusing on. I started as an architect and did my master's of architecture as well as sustainability studies at the University of Minnesota. And through that coursework, we were doing a lot of energy modeling and, and, and like designing net positive buildings, buildings that produce more energy than they consume. And I think the, the challenge is not like we know how to do the design and make it happen. The challenge is then really getting it integrated into practice. And so that's what Precipitate is really about. We have a team of six people. We are all working together, not only the, the technical aspects, but thinking about policy and at the state and city level, providing tools through energy modeling, and then doing architecture of our own uh, for, for a few projects. That helps us kind of like explore how we can move more quickly to net positive buildings, specifically kind of in the, the Twin Cities area in, in the state of Minnesota. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for that because, as you know, both technology and policy are moving us towards electrification. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start there. How is this kind of moving towards electrification? What does it mean for built infrastructure in kind of the Twin Cities in the Midwest? Currently, we're working on the Minneapolis Climate Equity Plan and figuring out how we can get to carbon neutrality as quickly as possible in the most equitable way possible. And I think, you know, we could just electrify everything. And the concern with that is that's really expensive for energy. Like if we do nothing to buildings, if we just electrify mechanical systems, it's expensive, right? Like if people's energy bills will shoot up. That's not very equitable. We're going to create strain on the grid. Some of the studies I've seen is just electrifying all the houses when doing nothing to the building envelope will increase that strain by six to seven times. But with some really kind of strategic investments in weatherization and in new buildings that perform really, really well and have a really um, robust building envelope, we can reduce the strain on the grid and actually have buildings use less energy being all electric than if they were the current building stuff that exists today. So it's a really important piece of the larger tool of electrification, thinking about reducing the energy load and the energy demand from buildings, particularly from heating systems. And that's where a lot of our work focuses on increasing insulation, getting rid of thermal bridging, increasing air sealing, having some really high quality windows and doors in there that let in a lot of light and heat from the sun from southern windows in the winter and kind of block it in the, the summer to keep cooling loads, loads lower and heating loads low as well. And so it's really exciting to be able to use building science to solve these bigger problems of, of equity, energy bills, energy burden is what we call it, the percent of people's income that they spend on energy costs and have some really beautiful, long-lasting, sustainable buildings in the process. So you started to frame this up, I think, really well, This the importance of energy efficiency in the context of electrification, mm -hmm. right? You can't just electrify. You have to reduce energy needs. So let's dig in first on kind of the existing built infrastructure. When you look out, you know, at, at building stock that's out there, what are some of the approaches that you're saying are most effective to reduce the energy use of our existing buildings? Weatherization is something that we don't do a lot in-house, but <laughs> is really important for, for the policy piece. And when people are talking about weatherization, usually what they're going in and doing is adding insulation to the exterior walls. A large percentage of existing buildings have very little or no insulation in the walls. Adding more insulation to the roof and then 
either replacing windows or doing air sealing of windows, adding storm windows if it's just a single pane, ideally replacing with triple pane windows, that's what we'd love to see, and doing air sealing, kind of whole house air sealing. I think so that's kind of like base level weatherization and that's kind of what's really necessary in order to be able to use a cold climate heat pump an all electric heating system in a building otherwise you're going to be spending a lot of money on you're not going to be able to run your heat pump as much to keep to, to, to take a, as much of the load of your building it's just going to be running on more electric resistance or a natural gas backup. So that's kind of the first step is weatherization. What we'd love to see them take it even further is more of a passive house retrofit. So that is if the building is replacing exterior siding, taking that as an opportunity to do air sealing from the exterior. So putting on what that can look like, just as one example, putting on an extra layer of plywood, taping on those seams so it's a really, really nice airtight layer, putting on exterior insulation that can be something Something like a couple of inches of mineral wool, it's still breathable, and then putting siding back after that, and then replacing the windows at that time too. So the airtight barrier is taped and sealed to the new windows, and you get the air, air tightness is really kind of your biggest bang for your buck in terms of cost and impact on your your heating demand. So really. Plug in the holes. Mm -hmm. Lots of lots of leaky yep. old buildings out there. Uh, the the scale of that work is tremendous. Obviously, there's uh, there's a very large need out there. So I'm we're gonna follow up on the heat pump conversation, but maybe let's switch then to new building mm -hmm. construction. What when when we think about all of the new buildings that we're putting out there, what are some strategies that that you're recommending or that you're saying to make sure that these buildings are as energy efficient as possible? Number one is what is the shape and size of the building? We call that massing. And how does that relate to the sun? And where in that mass, where in that building are the windows and how are they shaded? So if you think about this, you can arrange the square footage of the building however you want, but if you have it more kind of east-west, then you can shade that building on the south uh, you can put a lot of windows on the south um, so you let in a lot of free heat during the winter and if you put shading on those windows that's kind of the right depth then you can shade a lot of the sun that comes in the the summer because the sun is higher in in the winter so you kind of get that nice free heat in the winter and then block it in the summer when you don't need it it's a lot harder to do that on the east and west. That's why we like south-facing glass as much as possible. And you get some overheating if you have too much glass towards the end of the day on the western side of the building. So really, you know, thinking about our buildings in the ecological context that they're in, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, and orienting our buildings to the sun and thinking about how we're using the sun instead of trying to fight against it with mechanical systems. Once we have that orientation and kind of layout of our windows figured out, thinking about adding continuous exterior insulation. So you can have, you know, as much like as thick of walls as you want, but if you have a two by four in that wall, you know, that two by four is gonna get super cold in the winter and it's gonna radiate all that heat out from your building. So being able to block it with even just a couple of inches, inches of an exterior insulation is really helpful um, because you stop that uh, thermal bridge, that, that highway of heat leaving your building. And you're also at the same time making your building healthier and uh, more resilient because you are removing a source of condensation, which can lead to moisture and mold risk too. So kind of a lot of win-win scenarios for do that, doing that continuous exterior insulation. And then you want to think about your control layers, not only for continuous insulation. So you can think about that as a, a thermal control layer. You also want to have an air control layer so you don't have air leakage. You can have really great air blockage on the walls and really great on the ceiling, but if, if the ceiling and wall come together and there's a gap there, then you've, you're kind of missing all the advantages of, of having that, that great air ceiling elsewhere. So thinking about drawing, taking a, a slice, a section through your building and being able to draw a continuous line for both your thermal and your air ceiling barriers is really important to energy efficiency. And that's a lot easier to do with a new building than it is with existing construction. That's their design. There's a design yep. principle at play <laughs> there, right? Um, yeah. So we've started to address kind of this, the, a lot of the building envelope, and you brought up the, the need of that energy efficient design 
and retrofit to save the amount of therms that are needed to heat or cool a building as a precursor and not necessary part of a transition to these uh, air source heat pumps. So let's talk about that. What is an air source heat pump? What's the advantage? Why, why is it a central part of the conversation? Today? I'm not a mechanical engineer and I know I'm enough to be dangerous, but <laughs> what we try to do is get our load as, as low as possible using the building strategies so we can have these all electric systems. And I think, you know, the really the, the biggest advantage of air source heat pumps that we see is it's a separate system. Well, one, you can be all, all electric and then it's a heat pump. And I think when we're thinking about how energy gets used, like with electric resistance, if you put in one unit of energy, you get one unit of heat for that energy. It's kind of a one-to-one. -one. With heat pumps, it's upwards of, of three. So you put in one unit of energy, you get three or more units of energy. That's the coefficient of performance. And so it's a really smart way, I think, to be able to have energy efficient systems that use less electricity, which is good for people's budgets, and it's good for not overburdening the grid when we're moving to all electric heating, which is really important. And I think the, the other piece that we think of about too is not only how much energy it takes to heat a building, but where in the day does that heating occur? So the nice thing, if you have a, a really leaky building, you're you're going to heat it and it's going to leave right away. If you have a really airtight and really thermally insulated building, if you've ever used like one of those uh, vacuum sealed coffee mugs, you know, you can put in warm coffee in the morning and sometimes the afternoon, evening, the coffee is still warm. That's it's really the difference between a really well insulated air sealed building and um, one that's not. So you can put in the heat, like even during the, the middle of the day, and that's going to still lag and be there. And you're, you're not going to have such a peak demand for the more energy efficient buildings. So it's helping bring down that, that peak demand too. You know, when you take these as an individual action, say, oh, weather sealing or window replacement or good building design or the next step, which is transitioning to electric uh, sources of heating, they all sound relatively ap approachable. But when you look at this issue kind of in in the, the social context in the Twin Cities or the Midwest, what are some of the biggest priorities that you see? Where should we be focusing our effort and what are some of the challenges? Maybe I'll start with the challenges. I think it's not that we don't have the technology, right? It's like we have to transform the way we do things and think about buildings differently. It's really interesting because I think people really want to do the right thing, but it's also really risky to do the right thing. Because if you built buildings the same way for three, four decades, and you know that you haven't gotten sued doing it, then being like, well, we're going to do air sealing and do continuous in exterior insulation, like even though the science make, makes sense, you don't know how that building is going to perform necessarily in five years and what you might be opening yourself up to. So it does take a level of of risk and a willingness to try something new. I think on the part of a industry that is known for being really litigious and, and having suits be really common. I think in the long run, you know, these buildings are going to be perform better and be less risky. But I think until you've kind of switched everything over, that's a real barrier and concern. And I think just just to changing your process, who you're getting suppliers from, what your details are drawn like. It's really, <laughs> it's been, I think, good for us to kind of start from scratch with this new firm and our, our team kind of doing new design details. But, you know, I, I imagine, like, working in firms that have been around for a really long time, you have all your details drawn. You don't have to redraw details for every single project. And that's very time consuming, it takes a lot of research. Um, and you're opening up your risk yourself to risk every time you do something new. So yeah, I think just the time and cost on the design side and the time and cost too on the contractor side, figuring out a new process and developing new relationships. That's it's not an insignificant barrier. Even if we all kind of see the, the benefits and value of do that, you, you still have to run a, run a business and be profitable. That's a really interesting point because, you know, from a building owner and operator standpoint, investing extra on the front end will pay over the long term. And that, that might be a motivation for a firm to do that. But one of the, the things that I found interesting in energy efficiency as compared to like solar 
you know, solar is very measurable. Mm -hmm. You put a system up, sun shines, mm -hmm. kilowatt hours out, measured in real time, access on the phone, whereas energy efficiency and that upfront investment is really an estimate, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, we think, mm -hmm. we, we project that. And do you find that, that that also is a challenge, this understanding of the long-term kind of financial performance of these buildings and the willingness to invest more upfront to get that long-term payout? Even just doing an energy model of a code baseline building and then a passive house certifiable building, that takes a lot of time and resources to be able to do those two energy models. I mean, we're even struggling to just do one energy model, you know, so being able to know that difference, even from a modeling perspective, is time consuming and costly. So we are trying to do as much of that funded through grants as we can. So we have a better, like just general understanding of the impact. But then even once these buildings are constructed and complete, we want to gather the data and then compare that to the energy model and see what the savings are. But there's a lot of other factors. So it, we need a full year of data. So the building has to be operational for a full year. We had some buildings that came online in 2020. So we're like, well, we modeled it pre-COVID and now people are in their apartments 24-7 using a lot more energy than they, we thought they would. So can we really compare that? But maybe COVID is our new normal. So we should just <laughs> just look at it anyway. Like there's a lot of really interesting pieces that aren't related to the building envelope whatsoever <laughs> that have come up because of COVID. And I think the the other piece is just people use buildings a lot differently. So it used to be that the energy it took for lighting and heating and cooling and uh, were the like the major uses of energy in a building. Well, now when you we have LED lights and we are going all electric heat pump and having super energy efficient buildings, domestic hot water uses just as much energy as space heating. You know, in the past, the role of occupants and how long of showers they took and how many people were living there and how much they cooked versus went out to eat, like that didn't matter so much, but now it matters a whole lot more because it's just a higher percentage of the overall building use. So it's a little harder to predict because you don't know who's going to be living in the spaces and it changes when people move in and out. I think in general, the Passive House Institute US has done some good studies comparing energy modeling to actual performance. And there's like some people are above and some people are below and but that the average is pretty similar. But when you're looking at a small sample size of residential units, you're going to you're going to see pretty big differences from what was modeled to the actual kind of energy performance. So you've talked about this, you know, uh, I, maybe we'd call it a calcified capital intensive industry that is uh, risk averse and resistant to change. Mm -hmm. We get that in the energy <laughs> system. We, we, <laughs> we share that same burden in the energy system. And you've also talked about kind of the, the need for long-term study and being able to, to have real foundational modeling. So everybody understands the cost performance. We've talked about human behavior. What about, what's the role of building code? Do you mm -hmm. interact with that at all? What are you seeing happening in building codes that you think is positive and that could have a positive impact in reducing, increasing energy efficiency build? This is a great question. And I feel like I'm the person least able to answer it because I haven't done a code baseline building for six years. But I think just generally, it's really exciting the movement that I'm seeing politically in the state of Minnesota I can speak to. We are looking at accelerating the energy code so that by the year 2038, uh, commercial buildings would be net zero buildings in terms of, I think, carbon uh, and uh, energy use. So, you know, rather than having all of these one-off buildings that we're kind of using as pilots and, and case studies, moving everyone forward at the same time, rising tide moves all boats. I think we're going to start to see a really big transformation coming soon. And what's exciting about that is that just brings the cost down. So if, if you know that you're going to, for the next, well, like moving forward, have to get to net zero, um, I think that makes the investment in redoing your processes and details and everything a more of a sure thing and then less of a risky thing if you know everybody's doing it together. So I think it's really how we're going to, I've, been, I've enjoyed being part of pilot projects and kind of, you know, figuring out how we might do this on a larger scale, but that's really what's going to transform the industry and bring down costs for everybody. If everybody's op ordering triple pane windows, then it's not as much of a 
you know, we're just going to retool our factories to build those. It's not as much of a premium to get those. So I'm really excited about the changes that are coming through policy. Building energy efficiency, I would say we all agree is kind of on the right side of history. Energy is energy is a cost. And the, the more that you can reduce that cost over the long term. And so, you know, I think we see that and you have already talked about, you know, in an optimistic sense, how since technology has has been widely adopted now energy uses that used to be a blip on the radar the major energy uses in the building mm -hmm. that's that's a positive thing we're in the right direction what other technologies are you seeing that are kind of changing or, or leading to innovation and in kind of like building science and building performance getting cold climate heat pumps i think is is huge and what i mean by that is that they don't just shut off like you know in the mid the upper midwest where we have pretty cold extreme days I think it's negative five right here where I'm sitting. Like five, ten years ago, a heat pump couldn't function right now. But there are heat pumps that are being manufactured now that are working just fine at negative five degrees. So that's a huge difference just in the few years that we're seeing. And I think more people, you know, recognizing that air conditioners are also heat pumps and having the that just have kind of a different interface and software package and pieces of equipment, they can be used for heating too. So being able to transition when air conditioners are at the end of life uh, into something that can be both a, a heat pump and an air conditioner uh, used for heating and cooling with the same piece of equipment, that's pretty exciting as well. And what about energy monitoring and management? I imagine that must be critical mm -hmm. in, in not only like some of the work you're doing of, of proving the energy saving benefits, but it seems to me that more and more buildings are really using that to, to reduce their, their energy use or even to uh, change the profile of energy use in a building. I think it's really important and we know that when people are monitoring their energy use, um, just that act alone can, can reduce people's energy use because they're tracking it in its front of mind. So I think it is another important tool, tool especially as we see the major uses of a building shift from lighting and heating and cooling to what we call plug loads or, or things that people are plugging to the walls. Those are much more controlled by the occupants, both in like offices and single family homes and apartments. So one of the reasons that this conversation about electrification has become critically important today is the passage of the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, which extends some of the tax credits and uh, creates streams of funding to electrify. Have you followed some of that? What are the conversations like in the building space? How is this going to impact your work and the way we think about heating and cooling and powering buildings? I would say we're asking that question, trying to, to figure out how it's going to impact our work. I think some of the technology, the the, pro, the difficulty with energy efficiency is that it's like not something you go to the store and buy and plug in. So the ways that we incentivize it and fund it and and encourage it to happen are a lot less straightforward. And so we're waiting to see how the programs are designed in those acts to see how we'll be able to take advantage of them for our clients. There's some exciting things with energy efficiency that I think are going to be there, but we're just waiting to see, you know, how, how they will apply versus some of the other pieces like solar and heat pumps, I think are pretty clear that there will be rebates and we know what they will be. So yeah, well, we're staying tuned and I'd say every month we're going to another webinar and like what's, what's in the IRA Act and trying to figure that out. As you mentioned, you know, that, and that is the, I think you're really dialing into the difficulty here, which is, and you identified this at the beginning of our discussion, which is, hey, you know, without energy efficiency, when you electrify, you're increasing utility bills, you know, because natural gas has been cheap for quite some time and resistance electric is, is expensive. And so we see some incentives for heat pumps and heat pump water heaters and electrical service upgrades. But the precondition to all of this is, is home performance weatherization. I know that there's increased funding for the weatherization assistance program. You know, we're going to see a lot of efficiency funding, you know, as you said, it's hard to see exactly how that rolls out. Um, one of the things that we are optimistic about is that, you know, since now, both this kind of like home performance industry and what it's been 
kind of a separate industry, which is solar and no solar plus battery storage. Like those firms have been two different firms, but now they're all working in kind of like the same tax credit environment and the same streams of funding. Do you expect to see kind of these firms that service buildings, that they that there'll be more collaboration between kind of contractors that will see, you know, somebody that does heat pumps also be doing site assessments for solar and energy management and weatherization. Do, do you see some of that discussion in the industry? Not yet, but I could see that that would be coming soon. I think one of the things we've been talking about was just the, the need for workforce development is having kind of a consistent, like people know that for the next 10 years, they'll be able to do weatherization and there will be funding and contracts available for it. And I thought, so I think that's the the thing that's shifting with this additional funding is like, it's more certain and it's more certain for a specific amount of time where you can kind of ramp up businesses to cater to that. So I don't, I don't know if you'd see like a contractor kind of pivoting to include all of those things together or if people would be working more independently, but I think you know, just the more we can be consistent with incentives and guaranteed, the more we're going to start to see people shifting to provide those services because they know it's a, a business they can sustain for a longer amount of time. That's a very good point um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, with the 10-year the horizon mm-hmm. for these benefits, because during the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we spent quite a bit on energy efficiency. But if you look at that, it was a blip. Mm-hmm. You know, the money mm-hmm. was spent, it was gone, and it's like really a boom-bust industry and that has impacts on employment. Yeah. So I think, you know, point well taken, Elizabeth, that, that is a, that is a good point to make that, that some of the, some of the real benefit of this legislation is kind of this long horizon to incentivize people to, to really invest in, in workforce and invest in business models. A lot of this is coming from the federal legislation from your desk, you know, what programs or what policies at the state level do you think are really important? What, who's doing Who's doing it the best and how can we <laughs> learn from them? Yeah, I am really excited about the, the legislation I mentioned at the state of Minnesota. We'll see how it advances. It's, I think it's called the Accelerated Energy Codes legislation. Just like codes are vetted, we can trust them. They're industry-wide and statewide. And I think that's a really exciting way to move the needle forward as a state. And I I think still incentivizing things like I do a lot of work that are projects certified through FIAS that are really focused on kind of the avant-garde, like improving the technology so that we know when we are encouraging people to get to zero energy that we know we have a technology path to get there. And we've kind of tried some things out. So holding those two things together, I think, codes moving consistently and predictably forward and then also incentivizing pilots to to get us there i think that's a really good path forward and not forgetting about i I think a lot of times architects are like well energy uses for the mechanical engineers mechanical and electrical engineers and i don't think we see the large large role that we play with the building envelope impacting energy performance and i think that's starting to shift as well with more and more architects understanding the role that building design can play and the potential for energy efficiency so getting engineers and architects to have dialogue and conversation about energy is another important thing that I think is happening. Yeah, I think that's even embodied in two headlines this this morning. I'll read them to you from Midwest Thanks. Energy News. The first one is, as you mentioned, about two-thirds of Minneapolis homes listed for sale have inadequate installation, highlighting a hidden barrier to the city's climate goals and financial obstacles for homeowners. I think you've done a, a good job of addressing the need for that insulation, insulation, <laughs> insulation. And now with with a 10-year horizon for incentives and goals at the city, and uh, it seems like that's a really good time to, to lean into that. And here's the uh, uh, and this one, I think, leverages the last thing you said, which is collaboration, because the Minnesota Senate just passed a bill requiring 100% carbon-free electricity by 2040, making it a turning point in the state's fight against climate change. Let's go on to the, to the governor's desk. Have you been following that yes. legislation? <laughs> Yeah, and that's one of the things that makes me panic a bit. I'm like, oh, we have we have to get more energy efficiency so that we don't, you know, blow up our grid and then people say, oh, it's not possible. You know, it's like we need to make it 
as possible as we can from the architecture side too, and the efficiency side. You know, I think that is really sums it up well, which is that we really aren't going to meet these goals in a way that's cost effective and in a way that's equitable if we don't focus on as the headline says, all of the inadequate performing buildings out there and make sure we reduce our need for electricity. Energy efficiency is the cheapest electricity on the grid. (laughs) Um, And so we're excited to see the work that you're doing. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss today? I can just give a, just talk about the first headline that you mentioned too, because I think it's another great example of policy. We wouldn't know that. And if the city of Minneapolis hadn't passed the truth in sale and housing requirements for energy efficiency as well, And I think, you know, we often say like, well, you don't get, nobody's going to pay you more for a more energy efficient house. And I still think we have a long way to go to educate home home buyers on the value of energy efficiency. But we just sold our house in Minneapolis in the fall and we scored a hundred out of a hundred on the energy efficiency portion of that tissue report that, that you're sharing. That was a selling point. And one of the reasons that our house sold quickly, even in a cooling market. So I do think, you know, we might have not, we, we might not have like a lot of great data on the value of energy efficiency, but um, policies like that, that actually at least require reporting, I think are a good first step to being able to, for people to, to see energy efficiency as an investment that will pay off for their homes as well. So that was a really big source of hope for me. Let's dig into that a bit. So what is this policy? What does it require? The inspector comes to do the TISH report. They have a few additional pieces that look at energy efficiency. So they look at the amount of insulation in the walls and in the ceiling, look at the efficiency of your uh, mechanical equipment, and give you a rating, 0 to 100. And it's kind of the last piece piece of the the TISH report. And I can't remember. It feels like it's been just over a year that that has been in place, but it might be a little longer. And that's just in the, that's a city of Minneapolis policy. City of Minneapolis policy. policy. Yep. So at time of sale, they're collecting now energy data. It seems like something that other cities should it's be It's a adopting. great policy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you so much for helping us focus a bit on the, the value of energy efficiency. It's five degrees out there. It looks like your house is pretty yeah. warm. <laughs> Staying warm. Negative five, yes. I should say. <laughs> Negative five degrees out there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Take care. We would like to take a moment to thank one of our megawatt sponsors, Organic Valley. Organic Valley holds themselves to the highest standards and are proud to be one of the few always organic brands. Organic Valley products are sustainably made without the use of toxic pesticides, synthetic hormones, antibiotics, or GMOs. Learn more at organicvalley.coop. The Rise Up Podcast, Season 4, Episode 3, Building Energy Efficiency. Special thanks to our guest, Elizabeth Turner, hosted by Nick Hyla and produced by Kyle Galloway. Made possible with support from the Sally Mead Hands Foundation.